Uh, welcome, everybody, to our uh, opening event, uh, welcoming Rajesh Amura as our artist in residence. I'm really glad you could all join us. Um, you know, I'm just uh, musing on the, uh, you know, waking up and listening to NPR and uh, hearing about this 40% figure, you know. And it's hard to imagine that just last year we we're thinking of 99% and now we're at 47%. And, you know, in some ways, last year seems uh, so far away now. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe it's something about the fickle nature of uh, the way American um, popular culture operates and how fleeting memory is and how we're so caught up in any given, you know, kind of moment in which uh, uh, we're kind of obsessing over. Um, and uh, I, I'm particularly happy that we're able to welcome Roger here as our artist in residence because um, Roger has been doing this work um, uh, through thick and thin. Uh, he's been doing this work over many decades. Uh, he's uh, been doing it not just in Seattle and New York, but of course has been teaching uh, for a long career uh, that he just he recently retired from in, uh, in the Midwest. And um, it's really his special uh, skills as a master storyteller, which reminds us of these longer term kinds of patterns that are not quite so fickle, but are about uh, the deeper nature of the American political culture and how popular culture actually operates. Um, and his uh, playing with that, his, his dealing with that, grappling with that, and, and kind of carrying on that memory of, of what happened from his childhood and, and uh, as an alchemist, turning that into uh, his artwork and having that artwork uh, tell many layers and many facets of a story uh, that are not simply uh, documentation in the way we tend to think of it. Um, if you look at the program, you can see many of Roger's uh, incredible uh, body of work, and it just gives you a hint of, of what he's done over the years. And uh, I think as we do more programs with Roger, um, more will be revealed. Uh, I won't read that so much. I mean, I, I want you to look at that. Um, but I, I wanted to kind of just reflect from my vantage um, a bit of uh, the significance of his work. And uh, I'm from the Midwest as well. Uh, and uh, in many ways, I think uh, that experience of being in really the heartland of America is very different than obviously being in Seattle or being in New York. And uh, in some ways that gives us a closer understanding of in some ways that question of the 40 47%. And I, I think that's a real issue that, especially we in New York where we kind of, oh, poo poo on this, you know, have to really understand that and take that more seriously. And I think that's the kind of long term engagement and grappling that, um, that Roger has been involved in. Um, uh, living there, uh, collecting uh, all of these various tchotchkes, the, the racist tchotchkes that are part of his collection, um, mining, gleaning through American popular culture, and then uh, transforming that uh, with the deep insight he gained uh, from uh, having his family, having been in a concentration camp. Um, and engaging with that in ways over time and each moment uh, over the decades. Uh, I think there are different moments in which that pattern emerges in uh, ways that perhaps are surprising, but of course our memory in this society is so short that it seems like, oh, where did this come from? Oh, where did this come from? Next decade, where did this come from? But of course, Roger's been there to kind of connect the dots, remind us, and his own work has transformed uh, decade by decade as well. And that's something I think we'll get, a, uh, we'll get a chance to see during his residency. So in many ways, I think of Roger not only as um, an alchemist, but also as, uh, as, as a warrior, as you see in many of the, uh, the way he represents himself as well, dealing with uh, these crazy images. Sometimes he's a trickster in which he inhabits Mickey Mouse, or he becomes General George Washington crossing the Delaware. Um, so it's something about this direct knowledge that gets um, immersed in the heartland of this country and something uh, kind of magical and different and complex begins to come out of that. 
uh, it's very easy to kind of look at Roger's paintings and just think that we get them very quickly. I mean, they're such strong colors and they have the kind of uh, deceptive appearance of being something like a cartoon or a comic in which we are taught and we've been accustomed to just saying, oh yes, we know what that is and to move on. But in fact, um, I think it's, um, uh, you know, and, and in this day and age in which we're inundated by South Park and the latest 3D animation, uh, it's very easy to think, oh, you know, it's, it's kind of like that, you know, get, f get fooled by the form of, of this work. Uh, Roger, of course, is far more than even, uh, let's say, South Park. I know a lot of our students love South Park, um, but uh, in many ways, he's more like Richard Pryor, right? Um, and in other ways, um, we can think of, oh, Roger's making social commentary, and this is a time in the age of cable in which pundits are a dime a dozen. He, Roger's certainly not that. He's more like someone like Bill Moyers, who's been there doing this work engaged for decades. Um, so I think there are many uh, layers and facets um, uh, to Roger's incis incisiveness and humor. And um, we're going to get a glimmer of that, I think, uh, today, uh, both in his work uh, and um, in the conversation that we're going to have. Um, so first of all, uh, let, please join me in, in uh, giving a round of applause to uh, Roger Shimura. Roger, it's nice to stand up. Uh, I'd like to first welcome um, the, uh, well, actually, uh, to, uh, to uh, express my appreciation for the co-sponsors of this evening. Uh, the NYU Center for Multicultural Education and Programs, we're delighted to be uh, on an ongoing basis a partner with this very important uh, center. And the Institute uh, for African American Affairs at NYU. Jair, are you still here? Uh, uh, Jair is here. Um, they're literally in the process of moving their offices, um, so really appreciate your being here. Um, and uh, also the Japanese American Association of New York. Is anybody here from the Japanese American Association? I think there, there might be, but uh, thank you for co-sponsoring this evening and also the Asian American Arts Alliance. Um, so we're, we're delighted um, that we could do this together. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion that we're gonna have with Michael Ray Charles and Arlene Davila. Uh, but first, um, uh, we're going to have uh, a little snippet of a performance, uh, a version uh, that was done uh, when Roger retired in 2004. Um, and uh, uh, Jane uh, uh, Hameson uh, uh, performed this piece, and she's been gracious, uh, Brooklyn-based artist, gracious enough to kind of play with that piece and, and do a New York version of that performance. So please join me in welcoming uh, Jane Hameson. How do we love thee? How do we whisper shimamamamora and spell your most mellifluous name? Let us count the ways, hundreds and hundreds of ways, any old way we want. Take notes. But where is Roger Shimamura? He's off painting an international exhibitionist and edifying and molding our youth, coveting kudos for his class. No, I heard they fired his illegitimate, illegal alien, I mean Asian cart 
ass. It was reported the man was deported cause he's a terrorist with the Chinese mafia no less. And what's more, surely the spurious son of a has-been whore, geisha concubine combatant Afghani enemy frontline serial swine, and a sinister Siamese backstabbing, barrio breeding bed Balinese, a Bengali Barbuda Barracuda thief. <gasps> Look at those teeth! A salivating savage suspicious type, despite his middle-of-nowhere quasi-academic elite's credentials, infiltrating a fine faculty with an artful career-covered design for a ruthless underground plot. I spotted a mile away that complexion of insurrection, suicide bomber written all over his face, with a trace of telltale signs and sails of opium to boot and shoot, illicit guns, taggers, and drugs, international hugs, thugs, heathens, and hoodies, and hoods in our God-fearing neighborhoods, racing cane and cartel cash to bankroll the next hijacks, attack. But I thought everyone loved him, love him. Oh, sure, because it appears he's so exotic, ethnic, erotic, shimalora. From, you know, bang, cock. A kind of wild Indian from Washington, a fomenting phallic, ooh, Ferner, <laughs> Roger, Hussein Shimonialist, tax hiking, <gasps> deficit driving, too big to jail, obese welfare queen on the dole, out, out of kickstart art. But I thought Shimamura was so smart. A super 1% surplus savant, stellar Sanskrit spelling bee prodigy. And behold, he's high and mighty and officially <laughs> Mr. Emeritus, distinguished professor, interloper, imposter, unauthorized race. Look at that grimace. And those paintings he pretends to paint, cryptic cartoons crafted with secret messages encoded to Tibetan Dalai Lama Al-Qaeda, six cells of samurai insiders. And Shimamura embodying his Dalit caste, blast of his family's interned minute of the past. And besides, he drives too slow. Or is it too fast? I don't know, drives me crazy. You know how they do. Who? Oh, those Chinese North Koreans. You've seen them, been stuck behind them. Got to get them off our highways, or sky high gas prices are sure to be raised. Shimomura, Mora, oh, don't worry about him anymore. He's through, he quit, he's tired. Shh. Tired of this, Shh. tired of this, Shh. same old shh. He's ready for a rest, for some peace and quiet shh. I defy it. I don't trust it for a minute. Tired, retired, shh. No, he's retooled, revitalized, reproducing, reignited with hate, 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 hate to retaliate, immigrate to the Empire State. Feigning a brief NYC shopping spree, but he's surreptitiously scheming, wielding job killing causes and rapid regulations, will targeting our most revered vital free market. Yellow Rat Bastard, 478 Broadway, prices can't be beat, way below minimum wage and age. Yay! Unless Shimamora gets its way. Shimamora, destroyer, job destroyer. Shimamora infiltrating the Big Apple with deadly, diverse demon seed. Quick call Monsanto to sue him, undo him. Weed out his E. coli off color contamination of our flounders, I mean founders, untainted colonial crop. Quick, before he goes viral, exterminate him. Cool, oh, stop him, stop him. Chop, chop, stop. Chop, 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 chop. NYU secure our borders before Shimonomura invades as a scandalous, unprecedented con artist in residence. 
insulate our institutions, defend what's dearest to our hearts, our endowment. <sighs> Avert the damning headlines, NYU resident artist kills stillborn babies, occupies NYU youth's unborn malleable minds. Sound the alarm, Shimamura's armed with perilous infectious critical thinking, God forbid. Unleashing intellectual endorphins, spawning unimaginable creative abandon. Applying Iranian arsenals of nuclear fission, trigger fusion, miscegenation, mixing crazy colored co collateral coalitions. Raging Raga with that dark and dirty blues, jazz, and hip hop. Stop! Ooh, he's gyrating agitating for an ultimate undoing, ungodly, oh, unspeakable, oh, I can't say it, Samoan, same-sex, student loan relief, good God, good grief. And what's more, uh, he's decrying the lying Ryan Bill, calling out evangelical vaginal probes, turning a perfectly legitimate pious state rape mandate into tumultuous ultrasound battlegrounds to rally swing votes of recidivist oriental felon parolees who pirate and tote free knockoff IDs. Get the authorities. All votes must be redacted for national security. Call the Donald. Fire everyone. Trump. Descend your ubiquitous towers. Power this case, bigger than birthers, all the way to the Supreme Mussy Court. Uh, Thomas Scalia, five to four, last resort. Sheriff Joropio, enforce, enforce. O pedigree party, GOP of our G-O-D. You must endorse zero tolerance. Commit to mid or mid commit or shit. Someone sketch something that'll stick it to shim. A constitutional imperative must, must force Shimamura to ooh, irrevocably self-deport. Exile him back to Siberia, or Iran, or Liberia, or Tunisia, or Hiroshima, or whatever evil access he's from, or Guantanamo Bay. Hey, for God's sake, before it's too late. Shimomura, oh, don't worry about him anymore. He's through. He quit. He's tired. <gasps> tired of this shh. Tired of this shh. Same old shit. Same old shh. Oh, he's so tired. 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 It's a great pleasure. Um, Amita asked me to be part of this discussion, and I'm like, what does an anthropologist have anything to say about all these wonderful artists? And then I'm like, oh yeah, I wrote about Latino stereotypes and commercial images, and like, what a wonderful opportunity to really talk with the masters um, around these issues. And um, so I'm here to do three things. We have 45 minutes before we have a wonderful reception 
So what I'm hoping we'll do is um, I prepare some very, um, very brief questions to generate some discussion so that we could all get to know more about the work, the man that inspired that wonderful performance and Michael Ray Charles. Um, and after that, um, I'm hoping that other questions will get you two to talk to each other about you know, some of the similarities and collaborations that you may be thinking about. And I'm gonna try to leave at least 10, 15 minutes for, to open it up for discussion so that the entire, so all of us can have a piece of, of this wonderful artist. So with that, much ado, um, I have asked each of you to talk for five minutes and about your work for those of you who are, may be not as familiar with it. And each of them, I think, selected a series of images that will serve as introduction, correct? We'll start with Roger. Here. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank Jana. Is she out here? For that wonderful performance. Um, and she covered just about every stereotype that I could think of since that's the subject of uh, uh, tonight's panel. Um, I, I seldom use notes. In fact, I never use notes, and I apologize for doing it tonight. But I have a list here of stereotypes that pertain to uh, people of uh, Asian background, and I wanted to make sure that I got them all. And so uh, just to sort of set the stage, I want to uh, start by going through this list. Uh, perception, there's a perception that all Asians are foreign and not assimilatable. And uh, if you have uh, Asian background, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I mean, still to this day, uh, I get asked uh, or, or, you know, told, um, how is it that you, sp you come to speaking the language so well? Or we how long have you been down? in this country? Th I'm sorry, could we turn the lights down while we're doing the, the images? Thank you. Um, there's, there's another stereotype that Asian people are predators. And um, now some of these may come as a surprise. And this one did a little bit uh, for me until I started taking uh, a, a more of an international uh, view, and um, especially uh, World War II and uh, the attack uh, on Pearl Harbor. Uh, there's also um, cliched occupations that if you're Asian, you must own a laundry, you must be a computer wonk, uh, engineer, uh, martial artist, uh, Japanese gardener. I, I know that I did that for a period of time, summers when I went to college, and, and it was always important to say Japanese gardener, not just gardener, because there was a, a major distinction. Movies ha ha have had a lot to do with uh, generating uh, stereotypes. Um, whites can play Asians, but Asians can never play whites. Um, Asian men are eunuchs. Asian women are exotic china dolls or dragon ladies. Uh, also in movies uh, with Asian themes, white actors still get all the principal roles. And uh, a case in point uh, is the 1990 film Come See the Paradise. I don't know how many of you saw that, and it was about the uh, incarceration of Japanese Americans. What was interesting about that film, uh, one of the stars was Tamalin Tomita, uh, Japanese American actress, uh, but the, the principal actor was Dennis Quaid. And when Tamalin Tomita gets sent away to the camps, the film is all about poor Dennis. He's lost his girlfriend. Yeah. Um, Racial traits, uh, which we all know about, and I think uh, a lot of my work, and certainly I, uh, Michael Ray's work, uh, has to do with that. Uh, in the case of uh, Asian stereotypes, the slanted eyes, the buck teeth, uh, the yellow skin, uh, well, I, I'm sure you're, you're aware of all those. Um, and the last one that I'll mention, and, and is very disturbing uh, in many ways, when slurred or insulted, Asians are quiet 
and non-responsive. In other words, that sense that, you know, you see comedians, and even today, wouldn't think of, of making a racial slur to African American people, but feel very comfortable in, in racial slurs directed at Asian people. And it's because there's that uh, belief that the Asian person is not going to come back at you or complain. And, and it's true very often, not so much as it used to. Um, I subscribe to enough uh, local um, Asian, Asian American papers to know that when something happens, such as the Abercrombie uh, t-shirts and all that, that uh, they all seem to be responding now. But you don't see them in any of the major uh, newspapers. So anyway, those are the, um, the lists, and, and you can add some of the things that Jana uh, addressed. And uh, I'm sure we'll come back and, and talk about some of these later on, and I could talk about how they uh, are directly addressed in my work. Thank you very much. As a note, uh, what we're seeing is, is both the work of Roger and, and Michael back to back. So it's gonna be going around so um, with no particular, so now we're seeing Michael's work. So um, um, yeah. Oh, that's better. Um, I, thanks. I'm not sure if I um, can offer you guys a list of stereotypes. I could tell you that my experience with the work that I've produced and continue to explore certain themes derived from um, just a simple um, position of looking out into uh, spaces and trying to understand the hows and the whys, the relationships between um, myself and, and other, and oftentimes, as I've come to realize, how I've been othered. Um, I grew up, for the most part, in a small uh, rural southern uh, community. Um, I, I often refer to it as South Central Louisiana, just south of the, the, um, uh, the Gulf, and just, just right in the center there, the bottom of the boot. An interesting cultural context. I often think, think of my upbringing as Rockwell-esque in, in, in many ways than not. Um, my home community holds the distinction of being the only place where a person in, in the history of American culture has been executed twice for the same crime. Um, um, I, most recently, my hometown made the news. Um, unfortunately, there are still separate proms. And the 1973 uh, graduating class is having a reunion. And someone sent out information about the reunion and it stated that the class of 93, we're gonna get together, but there's an after party and whites only. So it, it recently made national news, as recent as you know, earlier this month. Uh, I have also li li lived in other areas, um, Los Angeles uh, and, and uh, New Orleans. And it was interesting seeing the different dynamics of, of different types of people in, in Los Angeles as a kid. And then going back to the South and in New Orleans, you saw black, white, and a hybrid other. So understanding uh, certain things about my grandfather, um, the types of, he was a carpenter, uh, and when he would go to get paid for work that he did, he would always say, tell us to stay in the car. You know, I'm reading a book recently uh, about um, worst in, it's titled Worst in Slavery. And one of the passages that I ran across talked about how uh, black men in the South, when going to get paid for as sharecroppers for uh, work that they had done, uh, they would tell their kids to stay in the car because um, oftentimes they would not get paid. And it was something about negotiating his masculinity that um, I think was being preserved. As a black male, having been told and talked to a certain way in certain um, parts of the country, 
um, that he wasn't going to get paid for the work that he did. It would have been a, a whole lot to swallow if your grandkids was, were, were there with you. But needless to say, I've learned a lot um, through the years. And one of the things that sparked my interest in, in the type of work that I explore, uh, I remember as a kid, it was a very segregated gated, uh, space. And we would ride to ride our bikes to the um, the park, which was on the the white side of town, and it was the mile, the, the the city was about two and a half miles long. I'm not sure about the depth, but as we made our way, myself and my friends and brothers on bikes, I remember being, uh, and we we had to go along the the main street, and I remember being uh, kind of you know, a truck coming and, and kind of pushing us off the road. We ended up in a ditch. It was a black truck. I remember being called nigger. I remember Budweiser being thrown upon myself and my friends. That was my first taste of beer, but that's another story. Uh, but most importantly, I remember red, white, and blue. And along with that, there was an image of a Confederate flag in, in, the, uh, in the back of the truck. Those kinds of things lingered. Um, we went to school together, together in public school. And, and this is 70s and, um, and 80, early 80s. But at the end of the day, we got on separate buses and went to different sides of town, of the town. Uh, I remember we never played with the white kids. We only played during the school year. When we competed in sports, the whole town was there. But the stadium was divided, you know, and uh, somehow those those uh, I was asking questions, and I I continue to ask those questions about the hows and the whys, and as I've uh, matured and, and grown as an artist and as a as a as a person, uh, I've found some answers, but when I think I figured it out, um, it changes. And, and what motivates me, I think, as an artist is trying to figure out how the past continues to be present, why the past continues to be present, why is it necessary for the past to continue to be present. Um, so that's kind of a snippet of, of where I am as, a, as an artist. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let's go to the chase, I guess, and get to the heart of the, the politics of representation um, behind these images. And I, I know that what I'm going to bring up is something that you guys have been facing a lot in terms of how your work is received. But I think it's important to address it, which is these images are very powerful exactly because they are so familiar, right? Um, and I, I was hoping you could talk about the politics of representation involved in the strategy of using commercial images, right, and images from popular culture. Um, to talk back to racial stereotypes, right? Because this happened to be oftentimes the same images that have been implicated historically in reproducing racial hierarchies and racial stereotypes. So the question is, can you tell us a little bit about that, the politics of that strategy? Why do you think it's important to engage with this material today? And how would you respond to people who do not understand that strategy or may perhaps see it too literally, right? Um, and not understand, lose the irony or the whole commentary that is so powerful. So um, if you could engage with that, which I'm sure it's, it's a common response to your work, um, we'd love to, I'd love to hear a couple of um, your thoughts about that. Roger? Yeah, I, I could, of course, only speak for myself uh, on that. I'm old enough to remember World War II. I'm old enough to remember these images as being quite common in newspapers and magazines. Uh, and, and I was old enough to also realize that they were depicting me, uh, in a sense. Maybe not politically, but physically. They were talking about perhaps my parents or, or my grandparents. Um, so, so they were extremely hurtful when I realized that, that this was me. Um, after a period of time, this subsided, of course, uh, but they, they would come back periodically. 
And I remember in the early 90s, during the US auto crisis, these images started coming back. And one day I opened up the newspaper looking at the uh, Kansas City Star, and there's a huge full page drawing of a Japanese Zero uh, fighter plane bombing Kansas City with Toyotas and Hondas. And of course, flying the airplane is a buck tooth, slant eyed, yellow skin Jap. And, and right on the heels of that, I remember going to the bar I used to drink at. And on December 7th, of course, Pearl Harbor Day, they would have a drink called kamikaze. And there was an airplane again with the slanted eyes, you know, and here, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about maybe just 10 years ago I, I was seeing this. And those aren't the only two examples. There, there are others, but those were two of the more poignant examples that, that I recall that I felt directly victimized by. And so when people say, you know, why do you bring these images back? You're resurrecting something so unpopular and, and tasteless. I know that Michael Ray has had some experiences himself that, that I hope he'll share with you. Um, they're not dead. Uh, they're very much alive. And this list of stereotypes that I read to you, they don't always have to be in the form of yellow skin, buck teeth, and slanted eyes. There are all kinds of stereotypes. And boy, I could give you a long laundry list of, of ones that have happened. I've, done several series of paintings uh, on just stories that uh, I've experienced in a very direct uh, way that continue to happen almost on a, a weekly basis. So, Michael Ray. Can you state the question again? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. We're talking about the old debate about, well, do these images, you know. Well, necessary or not. Yeah, um, do they implicate and reproduce racism, or are you actually talking back to racial stereotypes and challenging them? Some people um, believe that, you know, they take this, this work figuratively, they lose, they don't, they don't get the irony, or they don't get the context, or they don't get the intention. And as a result, right, the debate goes, goes as to, you know, and, and what Roger just said is so powerful, you know, it's just like, these images are not gone, they're here. But, um, you know, which- Well, I know, you know, I know too that you've been criticized by other African-American artists for some of these images as being too strong. And that, yeah. you know, people from your own ethnic family, I, you know, I haven't experienced that. You haven't? No. Wow. But that's part of the stereotype yeah. here, remember the- Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. They don't- uh, when slurred or insulted, Asians are quiet and non-responsive. Well, uh, you know, I, I have had my, my fair share of, of criticism. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember the movie Airplane. Remember that movie? I think it's '70s. The scene on the um, on the on the airplane when the nun is crying and everybody lines up with chains and whips and, and sticks and bats and whatever else to, to, to shut her up. Um, you know, I remember giving, uh, well, I guess it was a public oral defense of my work. And, and it, was, it was sort of like that. It was like, okay, who's gonna come up next? The line was at the door and, and what do they have behind their back, their back, you know? It was sort of like that. But, Roger, if, if I heard this correctly, you said they're still here. Um, they're, the images are still very present. Um, but I think what's most important is the, uh, the ideas and, and I think, and, and how the ideas fit within the cultural hierarchy that uh, is ever changing, I might add, with each new generation. Uh, we would imagine that today we're dealing with a generation that's much more liberal and open to racial differences. Well, th that is in fact what I've come to realize as being the truth, but what I also realize is that where the stereotypes become necessary and at times um, uh, really dangerous is when um, 
when the power structure is, 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 um, is potentially being compromised, I, I think. And, and um, obviously we have an African-American president and um, hopefully one day we'll have a female president. Hopefully one day we'll have an Asian pre um, pr American president or um, uh, Mexican American president or Puerto Rican or whatever other, uh, hopefully that's, that's possible. And I think it is, but the reality is um, what we deal with, I think Roger and I deal with in terms of image construction, I, I think there's, there's a, a connection to wanting to understand how uh, pervasive these, these images were. I know myself, I you know, wanted to know how they were constructed, who were constructed, who constructed them, the psychological um, dynamics surrounding uh, their intent, how they were used, how they were marketed, and, and, and most importantly, how they then affected the masses. And they're, they're around, but more subtle ways uh, in film, um, in advertisement. Um, you know, I, I look at uh, advertisements constantly and w what seems to be the, the new norm, um, or the new now, or the, the now, not the new, because I'm, is there really a new? is the, uh, the hybrid, and that's not the best term, the mixed person with the bushy hair, curly hair. You often see in advertisements uh, um, a lot, because in a sense it kind of covers the gray zones between the, the, uh, the specifics of one race and the specific, uh, specifics of the dominant ideology in which we're all a part of, I think. I, I also wanted to sort of add because you mentioned you had not received that criticism, and just to sort of think about the reception of your work, because I was actually thinking, you know, the debate that Michael, and you know, that, you, that your work, I mean, people like Kara Walker also were criticized, you know, it was not, it was not only your work, but other African-American artists were criticized as to, you know, are these images, you know, allowed, right? And there was a whole debate about, you know, how do you engage with these images correctly, right? And as if there was a kind of, recipe as to how you can engage with racial stereotypes, right, when you're actually criticizing them, that there are degrees of abstraction or degrees of ways of doing it in a way that would be more palatable, perhaps, or more aesthetically. Mm -hmm. But I think that that discussion was perhaps one that was really generated from art history or curators, and I, and I, that perhaps, you know, so my question has to do with the reception of your work in regards to communities, you know, how the African American community, how Asian American community engaged with this work, that I think may be independent, you know, of that level of criticism that, that is perhaps separated from community. So my question to you was sort of to think back about this work and your communities. You know, how, how, what has been the response to your work from African American communities, Asian American communities, irrespective of curators and, and art historians and the whole debate about representation may be generated? My, I, I think the, the, the art world is, is in constantly, constantly in, flu in flux and, and looking for the next now. And we're artists, we're artists. And um, I remember giving a talk in Chicago, Chicago, and 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 I and I, uh, someone asked a question, "What about the community?" And I said, "What community?" And and I, at the time I said it, I wasn't quite sure what I had said, and and. Um, and you know, it took me some time to really think about that moment, that experience. And what I realized was, you know, this idea of this monolithic black community that, that doesn't exist. We have class differences. You know, I have, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, an MFA. I, I have six brothers and um, none of which who have graduated from college. I mean, I'm in a total different economic class than the majority of my, of my brothers. There's a class issue, so when you ask that question, community, uh, I think it's a loaded question to kind of frame um, one's, one's uh, not only one's ethnicity, but you know, how one constructs their reality. No, absolutely. I was making a distinction between the kind of criticisms around this, this, this yeah. you know, your politics of, of engaging with this strategy that generated from very close circuits, right, around art um, versus, you know, how 
you know, people engaged, like the, the people that are, you know, the, the, your audiences, right? Or communities that are constructed, like across class, race, you know, the people that like your work and that, and that think that you're telling the story that they feel is important to, you know, that engage with the work and say, yes, this, this is evoking something that, that, that I don't think, I, and I wonder if, there's a, if you felt that there was a, a connection or a separation between the way in which art historians or curator engage with the work versus the people that, your fans, basically, right? The people that think this work is meaningful, right? You know, you know I, I, I would love to cross that line once. And uh, amazingly, I, I don't think I've even come close to it. And uh, part of it has to do, you know, with that stereotype. You know, it's interesting because when I was talking uh, about that or referring to it, I could look around and, and I could see, you know, the Asian people in this audience sort of agreeing and, you know, smiling that, yes, that's true. We don't protest about that, you know. So it's hard to tell. You know, there, there's um, uh, a huge economic energy behind art that no one likes to really talk about, you know. But selling work is what I'm talking about. I don't think... Um, not, I don't think, I have never once in my long career sold a major painting to an Asian American, you know? Wow. And I have to say, I've sold a lot of work, wow. you know? Yeah. Um, wow. Certainly, uh, uh, not any of the paintings that have to do with stereotypes. I mean, that's light years away, you know, from that. And, um, and there's a lot of interesting material there. Um, Michael Ray, I know this flack that he received from a uh, certain artist, Betty Saar being one of them, was interesting. I don't know if I told you this the last time we were together, but you know, I had dinner with Betty Saar, and here she is, one of the most respected African-American artists you know, in, in the country. And she had difficulties with some of Michael's work and the p use of piccaninnies, uh, and, and she felt that he crossed the line and I asked her about it, so just the two of us were having dinner, and, and I said, um, Betty, and I brought this up as gently as I could. I didn't want to seem confrontational. And, and um, so I, I you know, asked her the question, uh, what, did, what did you mean by your protestations over his use of piccaninnies and some of these you know, really difficult images? Because you know I do that too. You know? And she, and she just kind of shrugged her shoulders as she said, it's generational. And when she said that, all of a sudden, you know, I felt the air go out of, you know, the tires. And it was interesting. I mean, I'm sorry, are you finished? Yeah. It is, in fact, uh, that whole kind of debate in the public, the national scene, was, I felt was generational. Um, I was on a panel with, with, with Betty, and um, <laughs> she turned to me and was like, so tell me about your Neo Kuhn art. And I'm like, what? <laughs> There's like 250 people in the room. It's like, but before the panel, before we got on the stage, she was nice, and I was like, wow, oh, it's, so, it's such a pleasure to meet you, and you know. <laughs> Um, I, I think a lot of people felt it was generational and it was economics. Um, myself and, uh, and I, I don't want to speak for Kara Walker, um, but we were, we, we were doing work that was not endorsed by the black gatekeepers, if I could say that. I could, the black gatekeepers. And um, we were blue chip galleries and selling work and having shows internationally. Um, and it caused some problems for, for some folks. And, and I think it, w it had a lot to do with economics. I, I remember people saying, you handle the work in a cavalier, images in a cavalier manner. And, and I'm like, hold up. <laughs> I still feel the effects of these images. I mean, I grew up in the South. I wonder why there was, there was reminiscences of whites only on buildings. In fact, I've collected a lot of this stuff. I could tell you about the history of it. I could tell you about how it ties into minstrelsy, 19th century America. 
and, and so forth and so on. I've, I've done that much research. But then when it, the word gets out into the public, people want to somehow frame it. I mean, white scholars in, in art want to, we don't want to talk about race and politics. That's not what art is about. Hmm, let me see. Let's, look, let's open up an art history book. If art is not about culture and politics. Um, and, then, and then blacks were like, that's not how we look. But I remember having a show and offered to me in New Orleans, Louisiana. Ice Cube had just produced Friday, or was it Friday after next, Friday after next, one of those. <laughs> I'm a huge fan. You know, it's good work, it's satire. Um, I was told that my work, now we're talking about New Orleans, pre-Katrina, the elite group of blacks felt that my work would be detrimental to the people in New Orleans. So I was denied a show in New Orleans. I used to live in New Orleans. But Ice Cube's Friday after next, or Friday, which I saw last week and laughed, was welcomed in the theaters, you know? So the stereotypes are very evident in that. You know, there was, um, what was the, the, the film, the black stereotypes, um, the, the, comic, the comedy? Uh, well, Bamboozle was done um, at the same time, Spike, Spike did, did Bamboozle at the same time that he um, also did uh, Kings of Comedy. And Bamboozle was a critical, was critically acclaimed, but, but um, the King of the Comedy was, you know, that was a box office treat. You know, black folks went out and saw that. And in terms of comedy, they started talking about black folks and bad credit. You know, black folks are not on the front row because they, they you know, black people time. It was all stereotypes. So I, I think when blacks came after what I was producing in work, um, there was a generational shift. And, and I don't want to take up too much time, but I'll, I'll say this. I'm of hip hop, the, the hip hop generation, the old, earliest origins of it, when uh, never before in the history of American culture did young black men have a voice and the ability to, to, to articulate their experiences like they did in, um, uh, politically, I might add, like they did in the early 80s, mm -hmm. all right, hip hop culture. And, um, I'm, I'm of that generation. So when I wanted to make art, you know, that's the kind of characteristics I wanted to reflect in, in the work. So I also questioned the past and the presence of the past. And I think what people did not want to see or were not prepared to, for was that kind of raw voice coming from uh, a black body, let alone a black male, six foot five, and I've been told that I've been angry black man, you know. I'm not angry, it's like interviews after interview. Are you angry? It's like, no, I'm concerned. <laughs> you know, but. I, I have to say that what's interesting is that Betty Starr herself, you could see, is doing something very similar to what you guys are doing. It ex sold well. Ex except, so, so what I'm thinking is that what you guys are doing is some, you're doing it at 2.0, because we're talking about different realities, technology, uh, mass media, all of this is, is, is more to your face, and therefore you do, it, you do it's, so there's not only about generation, it's also about a different mass media society that requires, right, it's kind of more powerful it's not enough to be the kind of subtle commercial images that perhaps Betty Saar did and were powerful back then, right? Um, and, and significant, and, I'm curious, and I think that there's a continuity there that, that the your work really shares. Um, but I wanna open it up to the audience uh, so we can have uh, some discussion from, from you guys and we'll take a couple of questions, not just one, so you can respond in unison. Um, are there any questions? Any, anyone who'd like to pick their brains? This is. And actually, I'm going to start with one. So you guys, so you do, your work is being collected by African-American collectors, right? Yeah. I am assuming. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Yeah. OK, so one here. Uh, anyone else? We, I'm going to take three at least at once, not just one. Anyone else? 
Yes, okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for very, very interesting uh, discussion and also a display. Uh, I am working for the United Nations and currently working in Africa office, being Japanese. And uh, this is a very interesting uh, uh, experience here. Uh, my question is that somebody like me who is really Japanese or African coming from Africa, somebody like you who have been Japanese American or African American, is there any differences in the stereotyping? How is it, to, could it be reflected in your arts? Um, I wanted to hear your views if there are any differences in stereotyping. Thank you. Miyako, I'm glad you brought that up <laughs> because it goes back to a conversation that, that we had. Uh, these are friends of ours that uh, have a place in Connecticut and we went out and visited them for a few days but, and, uh, and I brought this up and I wasn't quite sure how it sat with them. Uh, so it's, it's a good reason to bring it up again. But I essentially blamed a lot of the racism that goes on today uh, not everything on this list, but a couple of them, uh, that it has to do with the fact that, uh, if my statistics are right, about 70% of uh, all of the Asians living in this country are foreign born. So that means that they come here, in most cases, without the cultural history that we Asian Americans, and I'm third generation, uh, have had. And, um, so there are a lot of things like, uh, let me give you this one example of the clothing store, Yellow Rap Bastard, uh, on Broadway. You go into that store, first of all, Yellow Rap Bastard is a term that was used during World War II directed towards the Japanese enemy. And now they, they have a logo of a rat with slanted eyes. And then underneath, in Japanese, is written Yellow Rat Bastard. The customers that, are, that fill that store are usually Japanese. And they think it's really cute to, to have these and they want to bring them back to Japan with them. And they have all this clothing that says Yellow Rat Bastard on them, you know. And I'm, you know, standing outside the store watching this and just sick to my stomach, you know. But it's a, it's a little example of uh, you know, a, another one is that a good friend of mine, Michael Omi, who teaches introductory Asian American studies at Cal Berkeley, says that um, 250 <coughs> students in his class, most of them are foreign born. They have no idea of the Asian exclusion laws, uh, of the uh, incarceration during World War II, uh, the fact that uh, Asian women couldn't be brought over for a long period of time. I mean, there's a whole laundry list of things that were directed against Asian people. They had no idea. These people today are coming to this country uh, competitive financially already in a pretty strong position and uh, so are, are not sensitive to the same things that those, that those of us that have been here for three generations uh, find very frustrating. That we're still, you know, I'm still hearing things that I heard when I was a child, you know. So um, I just wanted to Absolutely. bring that in. Michael, do you want to add to that in terms of the global reception of your work, perhaps? You know, um, in my own trying to understand uh, how cultural perceptions are cultivated and uh, sustained, uh, I, I travel abroad at least twice a year. And, and wherever I go, I try to my best to, to see how people uh, live on a daily basis. I, get, I ask questions about how's the co economy, you know, and what sustains the economy? What do people do? I remember being in Malaga a few summers ago, and, um, and, and watching the news and seeing uh, Africans come aboard, ab come to the, across the Mediterranean and make, makeshift boats and, and, um, and, and being incarcerated, um, you know, face down in the, in the sand on the beach and, and handcuffed with the little plastic, I don't know what those are called. And I, I was 
not only disturbed by that image, but those images, but you know, I, I was intrigued by them, much, much the same as I am about the stereotypical representation. Um, and what I realize is that the problems that, that a lot of European countries are having with, with immigrants has to do with, with um, obviously Africans coming over for a better quality of life, not unlike with Mexicans uh, coming across the border here in America. Uh, there's a lot of similarities. Um, and it has to do with what's at stake is their cultural security, preservation. Uh, maybe that isn't at stake, but that's what's preserved or, or attempted to, to be preserved. Um, in terms of how my work is received in, a, in kind of a global context, my experiences abroad have informed my work in ways that it would not have had I stayed here in, in America and, and you know, I'm reading and, and, and watching films and listening as much as I could, the internet access and whatnot, uh, and, and attempting to create work. Um, the work is received in certain ways, in certain areas, and, 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 and much more accepted and than, than others, and I think a lot of it has to do with um, economics, you know. Um, I happen to sell work as an artist, and uh, some European I'm curious, field. do you have African-American collectors, yeah. unlike uh, Roger? Yeah, and that's Wonderful. disappointing. We should work on that, Roger. We, we need to get you. It's a, no, it's a, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, I mean, Absolutely. It's important work. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's another, another thing. I mean, you know, people see my work and they think it's just about black people. And that's the thing. It's like, why can't it be about any people? Metaphor. Any person. Right, exactly. It's just a black person as a stand-in. It's kind of like the reason why we don't see very many Asian leads in, in contemporary film, or it's an Asian film, and it's marketed to Asian people, or a black film that's marketed to black black people, you know. And if it's marketed to black people, Hollywood got it, has it locked down, right? It's, it has to be a comedy. Black, black folks don't watch anything serious, right? Yeah, yeah. So we have, a, we have a reception coming up, so why don't we get two questions and you'll, we'll wait to hear them both and then have concluding comments. So yes, the lady and then the gentleman in the back. Shimomura has confronted the Japanese stereotypes right on. And uh, I think it's very interesting and very challenging, and he does it with a lot of irony also. But I'm just wondering now, as you said, the generations have passed. The wartime of you know, World War II now, of course, is 60 years or 65 years before. Now you have new problems of the new Japanese coming in with a different attitude. I'm wondering of you, as an artist, what do you think should you, what do you think you want to confront now? What, do you, what is your challenge now? How, is go, how are you going to express this change? Oh, you know, I, okay, and I, let, let's get the last question because then, yeah, the gentleman, sorry to interrupt, Roger. Can we turn this off now, this projector? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, almost, yeah. Pain, it's almost painful. I, I've been uh, working in the 30s recently, and uh, Jewish caricatures are off the charts. Yeah. Every European country, pre-Hitler, plus Hitler, post-Hitler. And I, I think the sensitivity that you're getting hit with, there was no war involved in that. That is an attack that's a different kind of an attack. It's like a people, a culture, who you are. With the Asians, you can say a good portion of it has to do with, with a war that got the juices flowing. And in that sense, I don't see it as, as serious an issue, though I'm not Asian, maybe, as the black and the Jewish thing was, because that had a different angle to it. And uh, no, one, no one would ever get, you couldn't get away with a Jewish caricature. You could, it just would not happen. And I think you're getting some of that type of attack going your no. way. Because of the yeah. Well, you know, it may not seem as, as grave 
to you. Uh, it, it, it's, it's as painful as it was the first time I ever experienced it, to tell you the truth. Um, I, I think the real burning question has to do with um, why do you continue to work with it when it seems to, I mean, I would agree with you, it's some of the issues have abated. And, and some of that has to do with being directed in other directions. I mean, I think Arab Americans are getting theirs, or people with Muslim backgrounds are getting theirs now. Uh, but it's, it goes around. It, it just seems to sort of take turns, you know. And I think as long as there's a majority culture, perhaps, this will continue, you know, to happen. You know, I would say that, um there's a distinct distinction between Jewish representation and Asian uh, representation and black representation. Um, if one goes back to, to the 19th century, uh, I've, I've often said that um, American culture or, or Americans' first creative cultural contribution was minstrelsy. It was an appropriation of concepts of blackness. Those concepts uh, along with a number of converging phenomena in 19th century America, uh, contributed to um, our, our very aver uh, the, the very system that we depend upon today, the advertising community to market um, products. I mean, racial stereotypes of blacks were integrally linked to the earlier representations or earlier aspects of, of uh, American advertising. Um, I, I don't want to misspeak, but somewhere along the line, the, the, the conversions of fine arts and, and, and popular art came in the form of chromolithography. Um, I want to say the late 1860s. And I would imagine thereafter, representations of Asians begin to infiltrate. I, I would often wonder about if blacks were so despised that they had to be articulated in grotesque ways, why would an image of a black, or whether it's an accurate representation or an exaggerated representation, be used to market something that to, to someone? And I realized marketing, what was being marketed was nostalgia. It was um, the association with a time that once was, much like what we see in, in popular culture today. Um, and the, the clear distinction, I think, between Jewish representation, Asian representation, and black is that if you look at major technological changes within popular culture, American popular culture, for example, um, within the entertainment industry, uh, jazz, the images associated with minstrelsy went abroad. Um, um, uh, radio, Amos and Andy, film, um, Birth of a Nation. Um, what's that, the Jewish uh, guy, entertainer? Al Josen, the first talky film, first film with sound was, was, was Josen. And you follow that forward and, um, you know, we were in a different day now, but I, I was, I'm often curious about, you know, whether when we watch a Will Smith or a Denzel Washington, are we really watching um, a human being play that role, or are we watching a black man playing a role that's made for a white person, you know what I mean? Will's film, um, The Wild Wild West, was clearly a black person placed in that position to test the market. But um, they get roles that are, are written for, 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 for predominantly white actors. Yeah. So it, it continues in that vein. So um, I guess, Ed Roger, do you want to have a concluding comment before? Um, I, I, I want to put my anthropological hat for one second and, and recall the work of Stuart Hall, who reminded us that you know, what makes stereotypes 
powerful is not the image itself, it's the power that sustains it, power system that sustains it. And I think what's fantastic about this discussion tonight is that it reminds us that the debate about this, these images or will always be contentious. Any image, right, rep representing African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos, will be contentious as long as you have Asian Americans, Blacks, and Latinos in marginal positions. They are only echoing that that larger structural con structural. So it's not through images that you basically can uh, can change the system. You have to change structurally, and it's only once you have a structural equitable system that that images will be free, innocent, and, and, uh, and not as powerful. But until you have that, it, these images will always be contentious because they're representing and they're echoing that inequality. And I think that is important. I, I really love getting to know about your work because it reminds us of the, the, the importance of the images to bring attention to that history and not just, you know, not, not, um, not bring attention to the true reality of race and, and, to, and to racialize popular culture, right? Because we live in a society that keeps telling us that race doesn't matter, we live in a colorblind society, right? And what these what this wonderful artists are doing are racializing the whiteness of popular culture in a way that reminds us of, of that history. And um, anyways, I won't take more of your time. We have a reception, right? Um, starting now, uh, well, everybody will get a, a, the ability, right, to, to talk to the artists more. And um, so stick around and, um, and thank you so much. Thank you, Roger, and welcome to NYU.